Hello, I'm General George Meade, commander of the Union Army of the Potomac during the Battle of Gettysburg. The Gettysburg Battle was a three-day battle on July 1st through July 3rd, 1863, during the U.S. Civil War. It was one of the most important battles in both that war, as well as all wars in American history. <laughs> It is one of the largest battles ever fought by the U.S., the largest battle by some measurements. A story of honor and bravery, there have been 64 medals of honor awarded the Union soldiers for their actions during the Gettysburg Battle. Now, let's go back to 1863 and take a look at this very important event. It's mid-June, 1863. We are now two years into the U.S. Civil War. Originally expected to last only a few months, the war has been both much longer and much more brutal than expected, with casualty rates in the larger battles exceeding the casualty rates of entire prior wars. Because of this, support for the war in the North has declined, with some in the North calling to end the war. Attempting to take advantage of the change in sentiment, General Robert E. Lee develops a plan to take his Confederate Army of Northern Virginia across the Potomac River into Union territory. Knowing that the Union Army will follow after them, General Lee's plan is to cross into Northern territory, find a good defensive position where they feel that they have an advantage, and then entrench and allow the Union Army to attack the Confederate Army. If Lee can achieve a victory in a major battle in Union territory, the Confederates will propose a peace settlement that permanently leaves America divided into two separate countries. In late June, Lee's army heads north. The Union army follows. Both the Union and Confederate armies are split into core, which are basically smaller armies that can move independently from each other. Each corps can move faster than a whole army can move. This allows all the corps to move faster, as well as obtain some of their food and supplies along the way. Each corps can engage in smaller battles while they move, yet still stay close enough to the other corps in the army to be able to come together and regroup for larger battles. Each corps is made up of smaller groups called divisions. Each division is itself even a smaller complete army that can engage in even smaller battles by themselves. For instance, a division might capture and occupy a town. Each division is made up of several even smaller groups called brigades, and each brigade is made up of several even smaller groups called regiments. The Confederate Army of Northern Virginia is commanded by General Robert E. Lee and contains roughly 70 to 75,000 officers and men. It consists of three large corps, each commanded by a lieutenant general. Each corps has three divisions. Each division is made up of three to five brigades. There is also a cavalry division containing several brigades led by Major General Jeb Stuart. The Union Army is commanded by Major General George Meade and contains roughly 95,000 officers and men. It has seven corps, with each corps being roughly half the size of a Confederate corps. The seven corps consists of the 1st, 2nd, and 3rd Corps, the 5th and 6th Corps, and the 11th and 12th Corps. Each Union Corps is made up of two to three divisions. Most divisions are made up of three to four brigades, and there is also a cavalry corps containing three divisions. As Lee's army heads north, the divisions travel on separate paths. In what is now considered by historians to be a very controversial decision, Jeb Stuart takes his three best cavalry brigades and heads north by traveling around the right flank or side of the Union Army. Running into delays, Stuart does not reconnect with the Confederate Army until the afternoon of July 2nd, causing Stuart to miss the first two days of battle. One of the many functions of the cavalry is to conduct reconnaissance missions to gather intelligence on the enemy location. Stuart's absence from the first two days of battle greatly hinders Lee's plans and preparations. The Confederate Army begins to cross the Potomac River into Union territory. 
Ewell's Corps crosses in mid-June. Mills and Longstreet's Corps follow on June 24th and 25th. The Union Army crosses the Potomac right after on June 25th to 27th. On June 26th, Major General Jubal Early's division of Ewell's Corps occupies the town of Gettysburg just five days before the Gettysburg Battle. I'm early. The following morning, Early departs for York County. It is June 28th, three days before the battle, and Lieutenant General Longstreet is in the Chambersburg area. That evening, Longstreet learns from Confederate spy Henry Thomas Harrison that the Union Army has also crossed into Northern Territory and were currently near Frederick, Maryland. The Confederates had not expected the Union Army to be this far north so quickly. At this time, Lee's army is split up and somewhat spread out, with Early's division near York and Wrightsville, two divisions near Carlisle and Harrisburg, and other Confederate forces in Chambersburg and Hagerstown. The next day, June 29th, General Lee orders a concentration of his troops near Cashtown, which is about eight miles west of Gettysburg. All of Lee's troops immediately leave for Cashtown from their present locations. Later that same day, Heath's division, under A.P. Hill, arrives near Cashtown. The next day, June 30th, Heath sends Johnston Pettigrew's brigade from Cashtown to Gettysburg looking for supplies. At this time, most of the Union Army is spread out near the border of Pennsylvania and Maryland, near Emmerichsburg and Taneytown, the Manchester Union Mills area, and Hanover. On this same day, June 30th, Union troops are marching up the Emmerichsburg and Taneytown roads towards Gettysburg. John Buford's Cavalry Division has rode ahead into the Gettysburg town area. As Pettigrew's Confederate Brigade approaches Gettysburg, they spot Buford's Cavalry. Pettigrew returns to Castown without engaging Buford in battle. When Pettigrew reported what he saw, both Corps Commander A.P. Hill and his Division Commander Henry Heath thought the brigade had sighted troops from a private militia, not the Union Army. Even though the Confederate plan is not to engage the Union Army while the Confederates are still spread out, thinking these are just private militia his troops saw, Hill decides to send Heath's division the next morning in a reconnaissance in force. The next morning, Heath's division leaves Cashtown and heads to Gettysburg. He has two brigades leading the way along the Chambersburg Pike. Anticipating that the Confederates would march on Gettysburg from the west that morning, Brigadier General John Buford had his cavalry division dismount and entrench in strong defensive positions west of town. Realizing the importance of the higher ground directly to the south of Gettysburg, Buford's cavalry are trying to keep the Confederates from reaching that area before the Union Army can occupy it. As Heath's division approaches Gettysburg, Gunfire is exchanged with Union lookouts, starting about three miles away from town, with the very first shot of the battle taken by Lieutenant Marcellus Jones of the 8th Illinois Cavalry. And so the Battle of Gettysburg begins. The lookouts fall back to the Union positions as Heath's men approach along the Chambersburg Pike. After a couple hours of intense fighting, as more of Heath's division is arriving, Heath's division pushes Buford's cavalry back to McPherson's Ridge. While Heath's division is fighting with Buford's cavalry division, the rest of both armies are heading to Gettysburg. The Union Army First Corps is coming up the Emmitsburg Road, and right behind that is the 11th Corps. More Union troops are heading up the Baltimore Pike and Hanover Road. For the Confederates, Robert E. Rhodes' division is coming down Carlisle Road, and Juba Early's division is coming down Harrisburg Road. Both of these divisions are part of Ewell's Corps. The Union Army has been pushed back to McPherson Ridge. By now, John Reynolds' 1st Corps is beginning to arrive in Gettysburg to reinforce and replace Buford's cavalrymen on the field. Before his corps reaches the battlefield, Reynolds rides out ahead and meets with Buford. General Reynolds, sir, I sure am glad to see you, sir. My corps is beginning to arrive. The first troops should be at the battlefield in just a few minutes. Now let's go surprise Harry Heath. 
As the first part of his corps arrives on the battlefield, Reynolds personally directs some of his troops into position. As Reynolds is overseeing the placement of the second Wisconsin, he shouts at them, forward men, forward for God's sake and drive those fellows out of those woods. Immediately afterward, Reynolds is shot in the lower back of the head and killed instantly. Surprise! There is a midday break in the fighting for a couple of hours. During that time, the rest of Heath's division shows up, as does Dorsey Pender's division. General Lee shows up, and after realizing that his Confederate divisions will arrive faster than the Union Corps will, he decides to continue with a full attack. Soon after, on the Confederate side, Rhodes' division from Ewell's Corps arrives from the Carlisle Road and takes up position on Oak Hill. Juba Early's division, also from Ewell's Corps, arrives from the Harrisburg Road. And for the Union Army, Major General Oliver O. Howard's Corps arrives from Tannytown and Emmitsburg Roads. The Union position is now a semicircle north of town, with the 1st Corps on the left side of the semicircle and the 11th Corps on the right. Opposite them are four large Confederate divisions, Heath and Pender's division from Hill's Corps, and Rhodes and Early's division from Ewell's Corps. The Union Army is outnumbered. Get off my lawn! On this first day of battle, local Gettysburg resident John Burns is two months away from his 70th birthday. Walking out to the battlefield and borrowing a musket and cartridges from a wounded soldier, Burns joins the battle fighting in Herb's Woods with both the 7th Wisconsin and 24th Michigan regiments of the Iron Brigade. He receives several minor wounds during the battle. Eleventh Corps First Division Commander Brigadier General Francis C. Barlow is the right flank of the Union position. He has placed his division of two brigades on Blotcher's Knoll, now called Barlow's Knoll. This creates a salient, which is like a bulge that can be attacked from multiple sides. Jubal Early's division attacks and overruns Barlow's position, which collapses the right flank of the Union Army. With the Confederates also pushing hard from Heath and Rhodes divisions, Union General Oliver O. Howard orders a retreat and the rest of the Union Army falls back through and around the town and up to the high ground of Cemetery Hill. General Lee sends orders to General Ewell to carry the hill occupied by the enemy if he found it practicable. In what is now considered a very questionable decision that is highly discussed and debated by historians, General Ewell opts to not try to take Cemetery Hill. You will be sorry. The fighting dies down for the evening. During the night, more troops for both sides show up, including General Meade. It is July 2nd, day two of the battle. All of Ewell's and Hill's Corps have now shown up. Under Longstreet, McClaw's division has made it. Hood's division is arriving throughout the morning, and Pickett's division will not make the battle on this day. Jeb Stewart is also still unaccounted for. On the Union side, only the 6th Corps under Sedgwick will not make the battle this day. General Meade positions his army in what is commonly referred to as a fishhook formation from Culp's Hill wrapping around Cemetery Hill and extending down along Cemetery Ridge to a small rocky hill called Little Round Top. However, with Geary's division on Culp's Hill, the right hook of the Union line could be more accurately described as a candy cane rather than as a fish hook. The Union 11th and 12th Corps are on Culp's Hill and Cemetery Hill. The 1st, 2nd, and 3rd Corps are down Cemetery Ridge and the 5th Corps are the reserve troops to reinforce as needed. The battle does not begin until late afternoon this day. However, there is light skirmishing all morning. During a skirmish between Union troops on Cemetery Hill and Confederate soldiers in town, Private George Nixon, 
the great-grandfather of future President Richard Nixon is mortally wounded. I am not a Confederate. Late in the morning, General Lee finishes developing his plan for attack. Because General Stewart and much of his cavalry troops are not at the battlefield to help with reconnaissance, General Lee has incorrect information on how far down the Union left flank extends. Lee's plan is to have General Longstreet's two divisions march around out of view and attack the Union left flank. AP Hill's Corps is to attack the middle of the same line, all while General Ewell launches a demonstration or diversionary attack on the far Union right side. The plan is for the Confederates to flank and break the Union's left side, while the diversionary attack on the Union's right occupies the Union troops' position there so they cannot be moved to reinforce the Union's left. Ewell does have orders to go from a diversionary attack to a full attack if an opportunity for success arises. Before moving into position to attack, General Longstreet waits for the rest of Hood's division to arrive. Hood's division spends the morning marching to Gettysburg. After Hood's division arrives, both his division and McLaw's division then begin to march in a wide semicircle out of view of Union troops around to where they perceive to be the Union's left flank. It is around midday, and General Dan Sickles does not like where his Third Corps has been placed. His position is a little over a half mile away from ground that has a slightly higher elevation. General Sickles decides that his corps would be better positioned on that higher elevation, so on his own without consulting others, including General Meade, he moves his entire Third Corps to that spot. This new position creates a salient that exposes the Union left flank. Sickles does not have enough men to hold this area, and there is not enough time for him to move back to where he was. Upon discovering that the Third Corps has been moved, General Meade rides out to discuss the matter with General Sickles. General Meade, sir! General Sickles, why have you moved your corps to this position? General Meade, sir, the ground is higher here than the ground behind us was. General Sickles, this is in some respects higher ground than that to the rear, but there is still higher in front of you, and if you keep on advancing, you will find constantly higher ground all the way to the mountains. General Meade, sir, I, uh... General Meade, sir, I was just trying to get a leg up before the battle. General Sickles, this area cannot be held by either side. It's untenable. General Meade, sir, when I moved my corps, I was suffering from temporary insanity. After talking with Sickles, General Meade sends his chief engineer, Brigadier General Governor K. Warren, to the left side of the Union line to evaluate the situation. Warren heads to the top of Little Round Top and finds that the only troops there are flag signalers. Little Round Top is undefended. Seeing Confederates in the distance, looking like they are about to attack, Warren sends word to the 5th Corps Commander General Sykes for reinforcements to come. Before orders officially come down the chain of command, 1st Division 3rd Brigade Commander Colonel Strong Vincent hears about the situation and orders his brigade to move to Little Round Top. It is now late afternoon, and Longstreet's two divisions under Hood and McLaws are moving into position to begin their attack. When Longstreet's corps gets into position, they begin their attack with 30 minutes of cannon fire from 36 cannons. When the cannons finish firing, the first wave of the infantry attack is led by Major General John Bell Hood's division. Fix bayonets, my brave Texans! forward and take those heights. Some of Hood's division advances into the Devil's Den and Plum Run Valley areas, trying to turn the Union Army's left flank and take position behind it or upon its side. There is intense fighting in this area between Hood's division and Sickles' Third Corps, including a ferocious charge by the 124th New York Orange Blossoms Regiment. The men must see us today! The Devil's Den area is controlled by each side several times, but eventually the Confederates are able to capture and hold it. Two of Hood's regiments head up Big Round Top and three more regiments go around it, with all five regiments now heading straight for Little Round Top. On top of Little Round Top, Colonel Strong Vincent has now arrived with his brigade of four regiments and has placed them into position 
just in time to defend against the attack. On the very left side of the Union line, Vincent places the 20th Maine under Colonel Joshua Chamberlain with a hold at all costs order. The Confederates charge and assault Little Round Top. The 20th Maine is able to hold and repel several charges by the 15th Alabama, commanded by Colonel William C. Oates. Finally, when exhausted of ammunition, Chamberlain orders and leads a bayonet charge against the 15th Alabama, successfully driving him back and saving the Union left flank. He receives the Medal of Honor for this. It is worth mentioning, though, that there are a few historians who claim that the bayonet charge was actually led by Lieutenant Holman S. Melcher, not Colonel Chamberlain. This is known as the Melcher Incident and is one of a couple of controversies involving Joshua Chamberlain. Another was a disagreement with Colonel William C. Oates a full 40 years after the battle about how far the 15th Alabama advanced up Little Round Top. Push back the right side of your regiment. Did not, did too, did not, did too, did not. Over on the Union right side of Little Round Top, the Confederate 4th Texas and 5th Texas regiments are close to breaking through the Union Michigan 16th. Seeing that the line is close to breaking, Colonel Strong Vincent jumps on a rock to encourage his men, shouting, Don't give an inch! Shortly afterward, he is mortally wounded. Knowing that the situation on Little Round Top was dire, Chief Engineer Brigadier General Governor K. Warren has stopped Colonel Patrick Patty O'Rourke and the 140th New York and convinced them without orders from their commanding officers to redirect over to Little Round Top. The 140th arrives just in time to reinforce the 16th Michigan, charging forward and pushing the Confederates back down the hill. Down this way, boys! Jumping on a rock and encouraging his men forward, Patty is shot and killed. More of Hood's men attack Sickles Corps on Hoax Ridge, as well as the gap between Hoax Ridge and Stony Hill. Two of McLaw's brigades begin to attack Stony Hill. That area is defended by a brigade from Sickles Third Corps and is reinforced by two brigades from Brigadier General James Barnes' 1st Division of the Union's 5th Corps. The Confederates are fighting and pushing forward hard here, but the Union left side of Stony Hill is holding. However, Brigadier General James Barnes retreats his two brigades back close to the Wheatfield Road without consulting or notifying his commanding general. The rest of the Union Army on Stony Hill cannot hold the position by themselves and must retreat as well. The Confederates capture Stony Hill and begin to move into the Wheatfield. Union reinforcements are sent in and push the Confederates off Stony Hill and out of the Wheatfield. However, the fighting in the Peach Orchard extends over into this area, again pushing the Union Army out, and again the wheat field is held by the Confederates. McLaw's other two brigades attack the Peach Orchard. Sickles' 3rd Corps is stretched in here and cannot hold. Richard H. Anderson's division of A.P. Hill's 3rd Corps begins its attack. This completes the collapse of Sickles' 3rd Corps, forcing them to fall back to Cemetery Ridge. Sickles' men are pushed back to Cemetery Ridge, and the Confederates move back into the wheat field, as previously mentioned. In the process of retreating, General Sickles' right leg is struck by a cannonball. That night, his leg is amputated and donated to the Army Medical Museum, now called the National Museum of Health and Medicine, where it is still on display to this day. The second corps needs reserve troops. They are thin here, and the reserves were sent over to Devil's Den earlier. To buy the time to find more troops, General Hancock sends a single regiment, the 1st Minnesota, on a bayonet charge, sacrificing this regiment to buy the time he needs. Advance, Colonel, and take those colors. The 1st Minnesota charges Wilcox's brigade under A.P. Hill, facing odds greater than five to one. The 1st Minnesota is successfully able to delay Wilcox's brigade, allowing General Hancock enough time to find more available Union soldiers to move into this part of the battlefield. But the 1st Minnesota's casualty rate is over 80% of the regiment killed or wounded in only about five minutes of fighting.
The final assault on this side of the battlefield this day comes from Ambrose Rice Brigade of Anderson's Division of Hills Corps. Rice Brigade smashes through two Union regiments near the Emmitsburg Road and begins to advance towards Cemetery Ridge. Not all of Anderson's brigades have advanced into battle. Wright has no one to reinforce his advance, which then stalls. Wright withdraws back. Wright claims his brigade reached the crest of Cemetery Ridge and passed it. However, many historians are unconvinced that Wright advanced that far. During the three hours or so of fighting on the left side of the Union line, over on the right side of the Union line, Confederate Corps Commander Lieutenant General Richard Ewell has been maintaining his diversionary cannon fire onto the Union right flank. General Ewell is still operating under a standing order of diversionary fire with the option of launching a full-scale attack if Ewell feels that there is an opportunity for success there. When the fighting on the left side of the Union line dies down, Ewell decides to launch a full-scale attack by sending in three of his brigades from Major General Johnson's division. Culp's Hill is defended on the north end by Major General James Wadsworth, 1st Division of the 1st Corps, and all down the eastern and southern sides by Major General Henry Slocum's 12th Corps, a full six brigades. This is the right flank of the Union Army. During the intense fighting on the left side of the Union line earlier, five of Slocum's six brigades defending Culp's Hill are moved from Culp's Hill over to the left side of the Union line as reinforcements. This leaves only Brigadier General George S. Green's brigade to defend most of the eastern and southern portions of Copes Hill. Green's brigade is extremely overextended. However, Green, who was a civil engineer before the war, has his brigade build very strong defensive breastworks out of rocks, trees, and dirt. Ewell's three brigades attack Green's lone brigade. It is beginning to get dark at this time. Green is heavily outnumbered. However, Culp's Hill is very steep and difficult terrain to ascend, and Green's brigade has constructed strong defensive breastworks at the top. Two of Ewell's brigades attack the east side of Culp's Hill, while the third attacks the lower east side and southern portions. Because of the difficult terrain and strong defenses, Green's men are easily able to hold the east side of the hill. On the southern portion, Green's men are pushed back. The regiment on the right side the 137th New York, under Colonel David Ireland, falls back and takes position in a traversing trench. Defending the right flank of the entire Union Army against the attack now lies completely with the 137th. Colonel Ireland and the 137th perform a heroic stand here, including executing a successful bayonet charge led by Captain Joseph Gregg, holding back a larger force. The stand by Colonel David Ireland and the 137th New York protecting the Union right flank while under attack has many similarities to the stand just a few hours earlier by Lieutenant Colonel Joshua Chamberlain and the 20th Maine protecting the Union left flank. The Union holds Culp's Hill this evening. However, the Confederates do capture and hold some abandoned Union rifle pits. As the sun goes down, General Ewell orders Avery's and Hayes' brigades from Early's division to attack the east side of Cemetery Hill. At the same time, he orders Rhodes' division to march down and prepare for a follow-up assault on the northwest side of Cemetery Hill. As Avery's and Hayes' brigades advance towards Cemetery Hill, Colonel Isaac E. Avery is shot in the neck and mortally wounded. Lying on the ground, he is discovered by several soldiers. Major Samuel Tate of the 6th North Carolina kneels beside Colonel Avery, who is both unable to speak or use his right hand. Using his left hand, Avery scribbles a note that says, Major, tell my father I died with my face to the enemy, i.e. Avery. Outnumbering the Union forces on Cemetery Hill, Confederates advance past the stone wall that Union troops were using as a defensive barricade and overtake some Union positions. However, shortly afterward, Union reinforcements arrive, pushing the Confederates back off Cemetery Hill. Seeing the futility of trying to attack a heavily fortified position in the dark after reinforcements have arrived, Rhodes Division does not attack this evening. And that ends the battle for this day. General James Longstreet wrote years later after the battle that on July 2nd, the men of his corps had done the best three hours fighting done by any troops on any battlefield.
Still, the Union line held in that area. In fact, except for some minor Confederate gains, the entire Union line held all day. During the afternoon, Jeb Stuart and his three cavalry brigades finally arrive in Gettysburg. That evening, the commanding Confederate generals meet to discuss the next day. Longstreet recommends that the Confederate Army leave Gettysburg, head down southeast toward Washington, D.C., and follow the original plan of finding a good defensive position and allowing the Union Army to attack. However, General Lee decides to stay and continue the attack the next day. Over at Union headquarters, the Union generals meet and agree that their best plan is to remain in their present position. After the meeting, General Meade speaks with 2nd Corps 2nd Division Commander General John Gibbon and tells him, if Lee attacks tomorrow, it will be in your front. He has made attacks on both our flanks and failed, and if he concludes to try it again, it will be on our center. General Meade has accurately predicted the Confederate plan of action for the next day. It is July 3rd, 1863, the final day of the battle. Pickett's division under Longstreet has now arrived. On the Union side, the 6th Corps under Sedgwick has arrived. Lee's plan is to resume the attacks in both areas from the day before. Since Pickett's division has now arrived, Lee can commit more troops to both positions. The plan is to have Ewell's Corps again try to charge up and take Culp's Hill, while Longstreet and Hill strike the Union left side, with both of these attacks occurring at the same time. However, very early in the morning, before the Confederates can move into position on the Union left, the right side of the Union line launches an artillery attack against the Confederates located in the Union rifle pits at the base of Culp's Hill that they captured the night before. Ewell's Corps counters the Union attack by resuming their infantry assaults from the night before against the top of Culp's Hill, well before Longstreet's and Hill's troops have moved into position on the Confederate right. This throws off the timing of Lee's plan of having both attacks start at the same time. Ewell's Corps spends the morning making several attacks against Culp's Hill, with each attack being repulsed. It is about 8 or 8.30 in the morning, and the fighting on Culp's Hill has been raging for about four hours now. 20-year-old Gettysburg resident Mary Virginia Jenny Wade is kneading dough in her sister's kitchen. A stray bullet travels through both the kitchen and parlor doors into Jenny's back shoulder and through her heart, killing her instantly. She is the only civilian killed in the battle. Back at Culp's Hill, the attack on Culp's Hill continues on for another two to three hours. The final assault is similar to the attack the prior evening, with two brigades attacking the Union from the east, with the third brigade again attacking the lower southeastern portion. Confederates are not able to break through, and the Union line holds here. 12th Corps 1st Division Commander Brigadier General Alphys Williams later wrote of the attack, the wonder is that the rebels persisted so long in an attempt that the first half hour must have told them was useless. Because the timing has been thrown off, General Lee changes his attack plan for the Confederate right side. His assumption is that, because the center of the Union line is in a strong defensive position, and the Confederates have been attacking both ends of the Union line, which has been forcing the Union Army to shift men around as reinforcements, the center of the Union position is probably undermanned. Lee develops a plan to have nine brigades of men all attack one single location at the center of the Union line. Lee feels that, despite their strong position, the Union line will not have enough men in that area to defend against an assault that large. At the same time, Jeb Stewart's cavalry is to go east, circle around the Union position down to the Baltimore Pike, and then come up the pike and attack from the rear. It is important to mention, though, that not all historians agree that the Confederate plan was to have the cavalry attack the Union position from the rear. Some historians feel the cavalry were ordered to protect the Confederate left flank only. Ever since research from the 1880s, it has been believed that the focal point or target area of the Confederate infantry attack was an area now called the Cops of Trees. 
However, some historians have begun to argue that the target area was actually Ziegler's Grove. Because A.P. Hill is ill, General Lee places General Longstreet both in charge of the attack as well as selecting which brigades would participate. Longstreet selects all three brigades from George Pickett's division, all four brigades from Johnston Pettigrew's division. Pettigrew was promoted to division commander after Henry Heath was wounded on the first day of battle, and two brigades from Major General Isaac Trimble's division. Trimble was promoted to division commander after Dorsey Pender was mortally wounded on the second day of battle. For a total of nine brigades on the assault, about 12,000 to 13,000 men total. Longstreet begins to get his attack ready, and Jeb Stewart's cavalry heads east around Gettysburg. Defending the eastern portion of the battlefield area, the second division cavalry commander, Brigadier General David Gregg, with two brigades. Gregg and the two brigades are positioned on the intersection of Hanover and Low Dutch Roads. One brigade, commanded by Colonel John McIntosh, is from Gregg's division. The other brigade is commanded by Brigadier General George Armstrong Custer and is on loan from Kilpatrick's division. Sue me! Stewart's men arrive and position themselves on Crest Ridge. They begin to engage with Union skirmishers on Rummel Farm. General Stewart orders an assault by the 1st Virginia Cavalry, who charge forward, forcing the skirmishers to fall back to the Union position. Greg orders Custer to counterattack. Custer personally leads the 7th Michigan in the battle. Come on, you Wolverines! 7th Michigan and 1st Virginia fight a fierce battle with each other over a fence using carbines and sabers. Eventually, the 7th Michigan breaks down the fence and chases the 1st Virginia back to the Confederate position. But more Confederate cavalry counterattack the 7th Michigan, forcing them to retreat as well. Stewart orders another assault, this time sending in most of Wade Hampton's brigade. Greg orders the 1st Michigan to counterattack. Again, Custer, along with Colonel Charles Town, personally lead the 1st Michigan's counter-assault. Both sides break into a full charge, crashing right into each other. One of Greg's men later wrote that, as the two columns approached each other, the pace of each increased, when suddenly a crash like the falling of timber betokened the crisis. So sudden and violent was the collision that many of the horses were turned end over end and crushed the riders beneath them. Colonel John McIntosh's brigade heads around both sides of the fighting, flanking both sides of Wade Hampton. Hampton and his men are forced to retreat. The Union Cavalry has stopped the Confederate Cavalry here. Back at the Confederate position on Seminary Ridge, General Lee rides out to check on General Longstreet's preparations. Longstreet does not have confidence in the success of this attack and expresses this to Lee. General, I have been a soldier all my life. I have been with soldiers engaged in fights by couples, by squads, companies, regiments, divisions, and armies and should know as well as anyone what soldiers can do. It is my opinion that no 15,000 men ever arrayed for battle can take that position. Lee is not swayed. Pointing towards Cemetery Ridge, he replies back, The enemy is there and I am going to strike him! The Confederates begin their artillery attack trying to destroy the Union artillery and weaken the defending infantry. The Union artillery counterattacks. The number of cannons used by both sides vary from source to source, with some sources counting cannons that were there but not used. However, the total number of cannons for both sides combined was somewhere between 250 to well over 300, making this one of, or possibly, the largest artillery battle ever on North America. Cannon fire for the Union side is commanded by Chief of Artillery Brigadier General Henry Hunt. The cannon fire from the Confederates is commanded by one of Longstreet's artillery commanders, Colonel Porter Alexander. Alexander does not have enough ammunition to effectively soften up the Union forces like Lee desires. Furthermore, on many shell shots, the eternal fuses in the shell are inefficient, burn too slow, and take too long to ignite the shell causing many shots to be past the Union troops when they detonate. Because the smoke from the cannon fire obstructs the view, Alexander and the Confederates cannot tell that they are overfiring the Union troops with the shells. During the artillery battle, Hunt begins to silence the Union guns to conserve ammunition for the upcoming infantry assault. Hunt orders that the cannon stop firing one by one slowly over time 
so that the Confederates will be fooled into thinking that they were knocking those cannons out of commission with their fire. The plan works. Alexander and the Confederates are fooled into thinking that many Union cannons are destroyed that actually are still fully operational. Most sources claim that the artillery battle lasts about an hour, but a few sources claim up to two hours. As the Union guns are silenced, Alexander sends a message to Longstreet for the infantry assault to start, writing, Come quick or my ammunition will not let me support you properly. General Pickett then asks General Longstreet if he should step off and begin the attack. Longstreet, who still does not think the attack will be successful, can only nod his reply. To fully appreciate Pickett's charge, one must understand the situation that the charging troops are facing. For the Confederates to reach the Union line, the advancing infantry must cross over an open area about three quarters of a mile long, some historians claim a little longer or shorter than that, fully exposed to Union fire. The way a charge like this is performed is that the troops walk in formation toward the enemy line and then break into a run when they are within a couple of hundred yards of the enemy. While advancing in the open area, the Confederates must cross the Emmitsburg Road, which has a rail fence on its west side and a post and board fence on the east that the Confederates must climb over or break down on their advance. During a charge like this, the defending army will fire cannons at the advancing infantry, first with shot and shell, and then when the enemy is within about 400 yards, grape and canister shot, which are cans or bags holding smaller balls, basically turning a cannon into a large shotgun. The Confederate artillery assault has failed to take out much of Hunt's Union artillery on Cemetery Ridge. In addition, the Union also has available and uses artillery position north of Little Round Top and on Cemetery Hill. Once past the open area, the Confederates will be advancing toward Union infantry positioned behind a stone wall for protection that they can fire over. While, as previously mentioned, there is debate on where the exact intended target is for the advance, the area where the Confederates advance the farthest is a corner turn in the fence line now known as the Angle. The infantry charge begins. Leading the way on the Confederate left side is Brigadier General James Johnston Pettigrew's division of four brigades. Behind him are the two brigades from Major General Isaac Trimble's division. The right flank of the charge is Major General George Pickett's division of three brigades. Henry Hunt begins his artillery assault against the infantry hitting the middle of the Confederate advance, along with the artillery from Cemetery Hill hitting the Confederate left side, and Lieutenant Colonel Freeman McGilvery's artillery, just north of Little Round Top, hitting the Confederate right. The Union artillery rains fire down upon the Confederates as they advance in formation. The artillery shot and shell, pouring down on the Confederates, is wrecking havoc on the advancing line, creating gaps in the middle. The width of the Confederate line begins to shrink down in size as troops shift toward the center to fill in the gaps. As the Confederates advance closer to the Union line, they begin to approach the fences on the Emmitsburg Road. Crossing the Emmitsburg Road and fences slows down the advancing troops, creating a bottleneck. Pickett's three brigades cross the Emmitsburg Road and perform an oblique left turn that now has them marching at a 45 degree angle, closing the gap between them and Pettigrew's and Trimble's men. Pettigrew's division begins to arrive at the fences on the Emmitsburg Road. The Union 8th Ohio Regiment stands up from a hidden flanking position on the Confederate left side of the advance, firing all at once in a volley. Some of Pettigrew's men retreat here. The Union artillery switches from shot and shell to canister fire. The Confederates are now within musket firing distance. Second Corps 3rd Division Commander Alexander Hayes has his division stacked three and four men deep behind a stone wall for protection. Hayes has his troops fire over the wall and then step back to reload, with men trading places with each other to load and to shoot. Hayes rides back and forth on horseback behind his men, encouraging them. Hurrah! The left side of the advancing Confederates are now being hit with shot and shell from the longer range artillery, canister fire from closer artillery, Rapid musket fire from Hayes men quickly changing places with each other behind the stone wall, and fire from the previously concealed 8th Ohio Regiment. Most of Pettigrew's advance stalls and retreats at or just beyond the Emmitsburg Road fences. However, many troops do keep advancing and attempt to charge the wall just south of Ziegler's Grove. 
As they approach the stone wall, they are repulsed by Haze Man. The left side of the charge ends here. As Pickett's three brigades march, their right flank is now exposed to the troops on Cemetery Ridge. Pickett's men are taking many casualties, first from Stannard's brigade from the 1st Corps, and then from two of Gibbon's brigades from Hancock's 2nd Corps. After the Confederates pass by them, Stannard has his brigade march forward and turn right to face north, firing into the rear of Pickett's men. Moving toward the angle, Pickett's men are now taking fire from Stannard's brigade behind them and give his division on Cemetery Ridge to their side. Around this time, 2nd Corps Commander Winfield Hancock receives a serious wound in his thigh. Hancock refuses to be evacuated to the rear during the fighting. Pickett's three brigades finish closing the gap between them and the other advancing Confederates. All Confederates still advancing start to charge toward the Union troops behind the stone wall. As the Confederates begin to approach the angle, two Union regiments retreat, creating two places in the Union line which are very undermanned. Confederate Brigadier General James Kemper shouts, There are the guns, boys! Go for them! In one area, Captain Andrew Cohen orders that five cannons fire a double shot of canister all at the same time. This greatly reduces the Confederate forces attacking the spot. Union reinforcements arrive now. The other spot where the Union Regiment retreats is still exposed. Brigadier General Louis Armistead places his hat on his sword and shouts, Come on, boys! We must give them the cold steel! Who will follow me? Armistead, along with 100 to 200 Confederate troops, storm over the stone wall. Confederate and Union troops engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Armistead is mortally wounded and captured. Four Union reinforcements arrive, and the remaining Confederates that breach the stone wall are either killed or captured. The rest of the Confederate charge is repulsed at the stone wall. The advance stalls, and the remaining troops fall back to Seminary Ridge. The entire infantry assault is over in less than an hour. There are two other attacks that happen during Pickett's charge. During the charge, over on the Confederate right, Wilcox and Lane's brigades launch a supporting attack. However, they do not reach within musket range of the Union Army until after Pickett's charge ends. Lieutenant Colonel Freeman McGilvery's artillery and Union infantry fire, especially from Stannard's brigade, halts the advance with no Union line breaches. Also during Pickett's charge, over on the Union left flank, southwest of the Round Tops, Brigadier General Judson Kilpatrick is positioned with two brigades. One brigade, commanded by Brigadier General Elon Farnsworth, is from Kilpatrick's division. The other brigade, commanded by General Wesley Merritt, is Buford's Reserve Brigade. The Confederate right flank is defended by the 1st Texas in a skirmish line behind a stone wall with wood piled on top of it as breastworks. Behind them are Brigadier General George Anderson's brigade and part of Brigadier General Evander Law's brigade. As the infantry portion of Pickett's charge begins to advance, Kilpatrick orders a Union cavalry attack against the Confederate right flank. The first assault is the 6th Pennsylvania from General Wesley Merritt's brigade, who attacks on foot against Brigadier General George Anderson's brigade. Anderson's men repulse the 6th Pennsylvania, who then retreat back to the Union position. The remaining attacks are on horseback. Kilpatrick then sends in the 1st West Virginia Cavalry. The 1st West Virginia breaches the wall and fights the 1st Texas in hand-to-hand -hand combat, but are forced to retreat with heavy losses. Next in are the 18th Pennsylvania and 5th New York, but they are not able to breach the wall and are pushed back. Kilpatrick then sends in Farnsworth and the 1st Vermont. Farnsworth splits the 1st Vermont into three groups to attack on three different paths. All three groups breach the wall and engage with Anderson's and Law's brigades, but all three groups are repelled back to the Union position with heavy losses. Farnsworth is killed. The Confederate right flank holds. That evening, on Seminary Ridge, Lee has his troops prepare for a Union counterattack the next day. Pickett is inconsolable and seen weeping. That old man had my division massacred! General Lee approaches General Pickett. 
General Pickett, you must look to your division. General Lee, I have no division. Come, General Pickett, this has been my fight, and upon my shoulders rests the blame. General Longstreet was in command today, General Pickett. At least you don't have to worry that they're going to call what happened today Pickett's Charge. Over on the Union side, after three hard days of battle, Meade decides to simply hold the field and not attack on July 4th. Guys, come look. Pickett's crying! During the evening of July 4th, the Confederates began to withdraw from Gettysburg to head back to Southern Territory. Meade is heavily criticized by some in the North for not counterattacking on July 4th and not aggressively pursuing after Lee in an attempt to destroy Lee's army and end the war. Lincoln writes a famous letter harshly criticizing Meade for this that he never sends. As the armies leave Gettysburg, left behind is death and destruction. The Union Army suffered about 23,000 casualties, roughly about 25% of the army. The Confederate Army suffered about 28,000 casualties, roughly about 40% of their army. Many of the Confederate casualties came during Pickett's charge, with a casualty rate of just over 50% of the 12 to 13,000 troops used in the attack. The armies leave behind over 20,000 wounded men, as well as almost 9,000 dead bodies in a town with a population of only about 2,400 people. Some Gettysburg residents, including lawyers David Wills and David McConaughey, pushed for the creation of a soldier cemetery for the proper burial of the Union dead. A committee is formed, much of the battlefield land is purchased, and the Soldiers National Cemetery, now called the Gettysburg National Cemetery, is created. At the dedication on November 19th of the same year, 1863, President Lincoln, who is not the main speaker at the event, gives a very short speech, the Gettysburg Address, which is now considered one of the most important speeches in American history. And so my friends, I must take you back to current time now, and I must return to my place in the pages of history. It is impossible in a report of this nature to emulate all the instances of gallantry and good conduct which distinguish such a hard-fought field as Gettysburg. I will only add my tribute to the heroic bravery of the whole army, which I feel confident the country will never cease to bear in grateful remembrance. Very respectfully, your obedient servant, General George Meade. Stay off my lawn!